This floating train is one of the strangest things you'll ever see. Its genius, gravity-defined design seems straight out of science fiction, but to the locals in this very real German city, it's just a way of life. And it's already been running here for over a hundred years. But how? Why did this technology take off here, and nowhere else? It's the story of how one city solved its geography nightmare, featuring war, tragedy, a controversial inventor, and even an elephant falling out of a floating train. No, really. In the 1800s, the valley of the Wupper River here in northwestern Germany began industrial revolutioning a little too close to the sun. More factories are constantly opening to process the abundance of raw materials found nearby, and this surge in jobs creates an influx of population growth in the towns along the river, which are gradually sprawling into each other and will eventually merge into the one city that we now know as Wuppertal. But that rate of uncontrolled growth and expansion created a nightmare scenario. Most cities sprawl outwardly at all angles, but as as the name Valley would suggest, the flat land here is only along the river, so a huge new population centre arranged itself in this unusually long shape without any real city planning or forethought. The narrow streets were such a busy mess that attempts to build street level trams never really took off leaving Wuppertal to become one of the world's first ever traffic congested cities, even before Henry Ford took that concept worldwide. The amount of new houses, businesses and factories being built on this land created demand for a mode of transport to get between them all, but it also took away any space in which you could build that transport. There wasn't any room left for overground trains, the ground was way too hard and rocky to repeat the newfangled success of the London Tube, and the river itself was far too shallow to do any real transport on. So what's the solution other than subscribing to my channel? <laughs> Don't forget to do that while you're here, thank you. No, the real solution if you're an 1880s Wuppertal is to wait for a local inventor to say, I've got just the thing, let's use the only space we have left, the air above the river. Eugen Langen was born in Cologne in 1833, first working for his father's sugar business before starting his own manufacturing and engineering companies, including a factory in Cologne that produced railway carriages. And it was here that he was able to build a prototype for his pet project, the Schwebebahn, or the floating train. But how does it work? Well, the design is actually pretty simple. In the floating train, you have a metal track with wheels running along it, which is pretty much normal. Apart from the fact that the train then hangs off of those wheels instead of sitting on them. This kind of upside down monorail actually provides quite a smooth ride, and since the carriage swings outwards while turning, you can take corners with surprising speed without making it uncomfortable for passengers. It's an invention that still defies categorization, equal parts Victorian and space age, and its story up to the modern day includes more intriguing twists and turns than the route itself. Despite initial local scepticism, the city went with his idea, and 20,000 tons of steel later in 1901, the Wuppertal Suspension Railway was completed and opened to the public. And the effect is this absolutely mad sight. You're walking along the pavement or sitting in a car watching a train go above your head. And I don't mean looking up at opaque train tracks like in plenty of cities, I mean literally looking up at the train carriage dangling above you. This thing makes Yorgos Lanthimos movies look like documentaries. And inside the train, it's an equally remarkable experience, with neither young nor old wasting the opportunity to marvel at the ride, as it flies you gracefully over views of the city and the river, which is just absolutely wild. <laughs> Think about that reaction for a second. That's from a person in 2025. A person who's been all over the world, who's been on the Shinkansen. A person who's watched Blade Runner 2049 inside a metal tube 30,000 feet above the Atlantic. A person who has the whole sum of human knowledge in their pocket and who's still having that reaction. But this thing opened in 1901. Look at this early footage of the ride. Think how this person must have reacted. And this person, and this person the gasps must have been more deafening than the engine itself. They're living in a world where Bismarck, Brahms and Queen Victoria have only just died. Aeroplanes aren't a thing yet and television won't be invented for another 30 years. They've almost certainly never even seen the projection of moving pictures. And suddenly this exists in their city. It's hard to imagine how it must have felt to see and hear it running for the first time. Sadly, its inventor Langen never got the opportunity to see his brainchild fly as he died before it opened, leaving behind a complicated legacy. He's known as a great inventor in many fields, but like so many of the wealthy elites of his day, he was also a big believer in empire. He funded and even chaired various colonial institutions and even prototyped a so-called tropical version of this suspension rail 
railway, which was to be powered by animals and used in extracting resources from German East Africa. That never came to fruition, unlike this one that I'm riding, but even this almost didn't make it off the ground. Langen had pitched the floating train to numerous cities in Europe who were understandably unwilling to be the first ones to finance such a risky idea and believed that it posed more safety and noise pollution risks than a tube-style railway. Until he stumbled upon Wuppertal's city planning nightmare, which was actually his dream use case. Other monorails fail when they try to branch out. But not this one. Here there's no need for the complication of connecting lines and junctions. With all the population living so close to this one artery, it's basically the 1890s German steampunk version of the line city in Saudi Arabia. And in a city with a desperate need for transport but a desperate lack of space, train tracks with a ground footprint this size are actually genius. And by building it above the river, you conveniently follow the flattest gradient through the city, since, you know, the water has carved out its own level route in this valley. Nowhere is this absolute lack of flat land on which to build normal infrastructure more apparent than when you actually visit Vupital, and take two steps away from the river, being immediately met with steep staircases and houses that look like they're stacked on top of each other. <sighs> Wow, what a climb. And you can see how I'm only this far away from the monorail and I'm already this far above it. And even looking over to the other side of the river and the houses there, it all goes this steeply, this immediately, again on that side. So you can easily see how in some parts of town, the river is really the only flat space. During construction, there was enough skepticism that this futuristic design could really support moving vehicles that it earned itself the nickname, the Devil's Ride. A moniker that in those days could only be dispelled in one way a display of faith by a famous person. In 1901, Kaiser Wilhelm II and Empress Augusta Victoria rode the train as part of a cleverly crafted opening ceremony, and the imperial spectacle of it all successfully rewrote local perception and set the railway on the path to becoming an indispensable part of public life here. You can even hire a replica of that original Kaiser carriage for special events today, but ask any Wuppertaler and they'll tell you that the Kaiser and the Empress aren't the most notable passengers, not by a long way. That honour belongs to Tuffy the Elephant. Yes, she was an actual elephant. She was put on the train as part of a publicity stunt by the local zoo in 1950, but scared by the noises and the motion, Tuffy broke out of the carriage and fell from the train into the river. Remarkably, she actually survived the ordeal and her landing place is now commemorated by this stone. But it's not just the elephants that are resilient around here. After bombings during World War II, the Schwebebahn was already repaired and reopened by 1946. And it's stories like that that anoint the floating train as a beloved symbol of innovation and defiance for the local people here, who have by now been able to rely on it for generations. This suspension railway is actually statistically one of the safest methods of transport in the world, with so few incidents in its 124 years of service. But it wasn't quite able to make it a perfect century, and its record is not without tragedy. On the 12th of April 1999, the train fell from the tracks into the river, causing its first, and so far only, fatal accident, in which five people sadly lost their lives. It was the first train of the day that morning and an investigation found that the derailment was caused by overnight maintenance workers failing to remove a clamp that they had attached to the rails while carrying out repairs. The Schwebebahn was closed for a year while maintenance and inspection procedures were improved and has operated without major incidents ever since. Today it carries 80,000 passengers a day, serving 20 stations across its 13 kilometer route departing about every four minutes during the day. Alongside its remarkable longevity, it's also striking to this foreigner just how smoothly it integrates with the rest of the transport network. Far from running it as a separate novelty where you have to make an account and download a QR code to pay to use it, you can just transfer off a train or bus onto the Schreberbahn with the same ticket. But the main problem for suspension railway absolutists, who I'm sure that there's at least three of in the world, is that virtually no other city is this shape. Everywhere else sprawls in a circle, so they need a full network of connecting lines. Some cities also lack this neatly drawn line of dead air in which to put your dangling trains. And when you include the fact that metro tunnelling technology only got more and more sophisticated over the last century, it's easy to see why almost nobody else goes with this niche solution. I say almost nobody because there are a couple of other smaller ones in Germany and Japan, and plenty of tourist attractions in the US have installed these as a gimmick and later shut them down. But Wuppertal is definitely still the classic example of really integrating this futuristic idea into a city's network. Only 
is it even that futuristic? After spending the entire day here, I did begin to wonder. I mean, it's kind of crazy to even be asking that question when you're sat on something designed in the 1890s. That was the era of new faith in technology, of eccentric inventors promising to solve people's problems in new ways. It was the optimism-tinged pre-Titanic era of the world's fair and the promise of a better future for humanity. But does that make the Schreberbahn actually futuristic or just the past's idea of the future? And if this was such a built up and industrialized area full of smog from factories, would the people of Wuppertal in 1901 not have been sad to have the one remnant of nature in the city center be covered up by even more metal and engines? Maybe what's most remarkable about it is that of all of the ridiculous things that were invented in that time period, this one has the distinction of actually existing and of still being just as relevant to solving people's problems as it was when it was first conceived. If other trains are iron horses, this one is more like the great steel vein through which flows the heartbeat of Wuppertal. Langen's floating train's remarkable career of 124 years and counting is undoubtedly a testament to the innovative spirit of those days. It's a symbol of dreaming big to solve complicated problems, and it put Wuppertal on the map making itself the icon of the city and a beloved part of the daily lives of local people, who I'm sure would take up arms to prevent its removal. If you've been lucky enough to ride it yourself, let me know what you thought of it. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Monorail, monorail.